I am excited. You're going to love meeting this next person. You may know her. If you follow the world of politics, you know Lee McGowan. Yeah. Host creator of the viral award-winning digital media brand Politics Girl. Yeah, look at that. First launched uh, on YouTube in 2015, then you relaunched on TikTok, and now you're bigger than ever before, Lee. But <laughs> if that weren't enough, and there are all sorts of, you're an industry, and you're an industry for good things. You're an industry for bringing together a lot of disparate opinions and uh, allowing a real conversation around politics, around public policy. Uh, I mean, you're, you're the real thing, Lee McGowan. And now you have a real thing, New York Times bestseller. Congratulations to you. A Return to Common Sense by Lee McGowan. Here she is. Hi, Lee. Hi, how are you, Mark? How's I'm it going? excited. I'm much, much better now that you're part of this conversation. Congratulations on all your success. As I say, it, it, it's all the good stuff. You know, you really do uh, shine a light on things uh, that need to have lights shown on them. So, um, first of all, tell me about this book. So, the book, A Return to Common Sense. Uh, what does it do? What motivated you to write it? The, the, the subtitle, uh, and then I'll let you speak. I invite a lot of people on my show, Lee, and then I just speak for a long time and just watch them nod. That's kind of my norm. But, but I'm about done. But I wanted to make it clear, because I think it's provocative, that it's return to common sense. Go put it back up there, Tony, if you would. How to fix America before we really blow it. Uh, this is the title of your book. So tell us, uh, give us some touchstones for all of that. How do we fix America before we really blow it? Well, first of all, I want people to know that I wrote the book because I have great faith in America. I really believe in the American experiment. I am, if people don't know, I'm actually an immigrant. So I chose this nation. This is my chosen nation. I was living in New York, uh, going to school during 9-11. And the view from my apartment was the Twin Towers. And that day, like many other people, really changed my life. And it changed the course of my life and what I thought I would do with my life. And, um, and I decided I really had to be an American. And I cried when I became a citizen. I My first vote was for Obama's presidential election. That was the first time I voted uh, back in 2008. And I started the Politics Girl project as a response to kind of basically no one in my life caring about politics, which I'm sure most of your listeners have felt, you know, like this idea that when you start talking about these things, their eyes would just glaze over. And I thought, oh boy, I can kind of see things going off the rails, but no one wants to talk about it and no one really cares. And I think sometimes when you've had something for such a long time, like we have with democracy, you sort of to take it for granted. And I wanted to start a project in which people could understand the American experiment again, but in a way that we all talk, in a way that makes it accessible. So I started those rants in my kitchen that most people know me of. I'm just standing in my kitchen explaining things. And then I expanded it to the podcast because I was interested in diving deeper into things. And mostly I want people to go out into the world feeling smarter. And then it became the book because I really felt like we were taking a weird turn and I wanted to address the nation that I thought was at a crossroads. And the last time we were at this really big crossroads, uh, another man wrote a book called Common Sense and it was Thomas Paine. And he wrote it right before we, uh, we did the American Revolution. And I thought, you know what? He wrote this book for common people in common language about a nation that could go one of two ways. And he was very distinctly sure it should go one way. And I felt the same way. And I thought, who's writing the book today? And I thought, oh God, it's me. Well, and so uh, I wrote the what book. a great summary. And, you know, you mentioned <laughs> Thomas Paine. Uh, Tom Hartman was on with us uh, just, was it, 10 days ago. And he lauded you. I, I saw uh, he said, uh, like Thomas Paine before her, Lee is one of America's most effective communicators when it comes to the urgency of democracy and democratic reform. America needs this book, he said. If we reimagined our nation along the lines of Lee's six American principles, we'd build a nation we really could all be proud of. I mean, that's from Tom Effing Hartman, okay? Um, so let me ask you then, w take us through just even a broad stroke on some of these American principles you speak of. Sure. So, uh, well, the book not only kind of gives you a basic civics knowledge, because I start the book with 20 pages of what I call America 101, because I think that, you know, it's been a long time since a lot of people did high school civics, if they got it at all, or they weren't paying attention during uh, Schoolhouse Rock, perhaps. And we've kind of forgotten how the whole system works. So we're often upset at things that are 
you know, when people say, well, why isn't the vice president fix something in the last three years she was vice president? You're like, that's not the vice president's job. Like most of us don't understand how it works. And then we get upset that we don't know how to fix it. And I often compare it to if you told me that the problem with my car was my carburetor. And I was like, that's great, Mark. Um, what part is the carburetor? You know, like if I don't know, then how can I fix it? Right. So if I say to you, the reason none of these things that we all want get passed through the Senate is because of the filibuster and everyone goes, well, what the hell's that? Then we don't know how to fix it because we don't even know what it is. So I wanted to start with just basic civics knowledge. It's 20 pages. At the beginning, it says, if you know how our government works and you understand how the system goes and you get how our laws are made, skip this section. It's not for you. But if you could have a little refresher, like read these 20 pages and then we'll all be on literally the same page. And then I set up what I call six American principles, which are six things that no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, I believe we can agree, make America, America. And it's everything from principle one, America is a land of freedom, to principle six, that government should be a force for good. And I go through all these six principles that basically start us on common ground for a conversation. So whether you're talking to a Republican or an independent or someone who doesn't vote or someone who thinks their vote doesn't matter, or of course, a Democrat, you're going to say, yeah, I agree with these six things. So why are these our fundamentals? You say our fundamentals are this because of here in history, here's where we went off track and here's how we get back on track. Because I don't believe in laying out problems without also suggesting solutions. And I really think our country could fix so much and quite quickly if we understood how it all worked. When you talk about us going off track, is there a moment or an event or um, an era during which you felt uh, looking back as you have that we've got we began to go off track or have we always sort of flirted with going off track and then we kind of find the track again try to give me some sort of historical framework on that yeah. Okay. So we talk about this a lot. Um, I talk about this in the book in multiple different ways. I do think we flirt with going off track a lot. It's not just like today and it's immediately and we blame it on Trump. It's not that. Um, we've had many times where the country has gone off track. Obviously, when we started the country, we were off track from the beginning because we decided to hold on to slavery, despite the fact that they knew that they probably shouldn't, but they needed to make concessions to get all the states united. Um, we went off track during the Civil War. We went off track when we gave black men the vote, but not women. We went off track. And every time we've kind of moved along, we have progressed as a nation um, over the years, but slowly, you know, not as not as quickly as we could have. But over time, our nation was written into the Constitution, was written the ability to evolve, right? Of the uh, initial parts of the Constitution, one whole section is just devoted to amending the Constitution, to grow it, to expand over time. It's how we got the Bill of Rights. It's how we got women the vote. It's how we got um, black people the vote. It's how we expanded and changed and grew with the way the time went. So if you were asking me to pinpoint a time where we, I think we went wrong, it's when we stopped amending the Constitution, which would be in the 1970s. So we were progressing all along. We were getting workers' rights. We were getting women's rights. We were getting civil rights. We we were moving up, we got to Roe v. Wade years, and we were like, okay, we're making all these progressive moves. And then we just stopped amending the Constitution. The last time we amended it was in the 1970s, and it was like for congressional pay period. And the one right before that, the 26th Amendment, was when we changed the voting age from 21 to 18. But that's the last time we made any real change to our Constitution. So what's happened is we kind of stagnated. And then I think what happened is we started to regress. So through the 80s, getting rid of a lot of the protections um, that we had that stopped us from having corporate monopolies and things that would take us back to the Gilded Age, all the New Deal stuff. People did, weren't so thrilled with workers' rights. They weren't so thrilled with women's rights. They weren't so thrilled with civil rights. And there have been people over time with long-term goals to roll those back, and we'd stop progressing as a nation that would stop them from doing it, which is what finds us where we are today. Wow, such a great summary of where we are. And I think of, in relation to what you've just said, the way in which politicians can now promise a lot of things, pay lip service to a lot of things, because now there's just even an institutional knowledge that these things will never come to pass because you won't be able to get congressional vote on it. It's a, the legislature has stopped working for the American people. And you're so right to point to that. And what does it take to get that ball rolling again. Well, actually, it doesn't take as much as people would think. I mean, the force 
fourth principle in my book is representatives should represent the people who elected them. And I don't necessarily just mean the party that elected them, but the people themselves, as opposed to lobby groups or billionaires or donors, this kind of thing. And one of the things I talk about in the book is about this stagnation, that we locked the size of the house in the just before the 1920 census. We said, okay, we're done. We're not going to have any more representatives. Because up until then, we would do the census and count how many people were in the nation. And then we would also expand how many districts each uh, state had based on a population growth. And in the 1920s, just before the 1920 census, they were like, let's lock it. So we have had 435 members of Congress since before we had 100 million people in this country. And now we have 300 million people in this country and the same amount of representatives in the House, which is, of course, ludicrous, right? So we're not properly represented in this country. We're not in line with our peer nations. And it's very hard for those people to represent us. On top of that, we have things like I was saying before, the filibuster, right? So you have 80 some odd percent of the country wanting common sense gun legislation or wanting to have a higher minimum wage. And then it gets to the Senate and they cannot pass it because you need 10 votes from the minority party in order to pass anything in this case, because you need to have 60 votes in the Senate. So depending on the numbers, but that makes it impossible. And it allows the minority party to hold up the majority party from getting anything done. And then it allows us, the American people to say, see, no one in government gets anything done. No one gets anything accomplished. These guys are all useless. And that's not actually the case, which is honestly why I made the sixth principle. Government should be a force for good, that there is uh, a misnomer in this nation that when Reagan said this, you know, the nine scariest words in the English language are, I am from the government and I'm here to help. And I feel like he did the country such a disservice saying that because here he was as the head of the government saying the government is useless and we will make your life worse. And I think if you're in government and that's what you feel, what are you doing there? You know, if you're going to be a public servant, if you're going to represent in this case in our, our country, 800,000 to a million people each, then you sure as heck better be there for the right reasons, right? We shouldn't have a single Marjorie Taylor Greene in those 535 seats in the House and Senate. Those are such important jobs. Those are jobs that make all of our federal laws, that pass all of our budgets, that pay for everything, that can declare war. We should be much more um, deliberate about who we put in those seats and we should talk really seriously about expanding it so we can have more people representing us and a better representation representational government wow i mean that's just terrific once again like you just boil everything down so beautifully it's it's offensive to me that we in california have the same number of uh, voting senators that does north dakota south dakota wyoming fill in the blank i mean it, it, we you know it's a it's not only a populous region but it's an economic engine we have many of the same interests uh, working and concerns working that the rest of the country does, and yet we only have two voting centers. It's, it's absurd. Uh, but but then you point to the entire thing writ large. And then on the Marjorie Taylor Greene thing, I wanted to ask you, because it seems to me, and this is a frustrating aspect of, she's a perfect example of this, but there are also Lauren Boberts, and you see the, you know, the, the, the wannabes, the Carrie Lakes of the world coming up <laughs> as well, where they're trying to burnish an image. You know, they're really more concerned with building their personal brand than building any kind of real legislation or transformative legislation, even the stuff that they've launched, the uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, launched legislation is associated with a jihad against the Democrats and owning the libs in some way. So I guess what I'm getting at at the end of my little thing here is, uh, sadly, I see the way in which through social media and in other ways, the noisiest kids in the class, but not the best kids in the class, are actually taking leadership roles. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Well, I think here's the thing. Uh, we have a problem right now with our media landscape. Um, I think there's a reason people are reaching out to shows like yours, to shows like mine, these sort of independent voices, because we know that the way the media landscape is now, it used to be in the 80s, you know, uh, that... 50, 60 companies uh, were the political landscape. Now it's six companies that own almost 90% of our media. Um, and so we seek outside voices to tell us the actual truth because we're not getting facts the way we used to. But it also allows people who are um, 
using the currency of social media cred, of numbers, of hits, um, to get a lot of attention in this universe. And that's why people like Marjorie Taylor Greene um, succeed. And we have to sort of, I keep talking about having some sort of fairness doctrine for the new millennium, having some sort of legislation um, that doesn't allow people to lie to us for profit and power, that there is some sort of... Um, ramifications for lying to the public, especially from a position of power. You shouldn't be able to be, say, uh, someone running for president of the United States, standing on TV saying FEMA's not on the ground in these hurricane locations where they are, or you're not going to get any money because the migrants have taken it, which is not true. You shouldn't be able to say Springfield, Ohio is overrun by immigrants eating your cats and dogs. There's no ramifications for lying anymore. There's no ramifications for spreading mistruths. You can buy a social media network and lie to us constantly and fill in echo chamber. And honestly, people should be able to trust their media networks. They should be able to trust their president. They should be able to trust that the news is the news. And we are not functioning anymore, living in two separate realities. So we need to use the government as a force for good and bring in some sort of legislation that would allow us either financially and or uh, with broadcast licensing to um, stop people from lying to us for profit and power. Because I think most people can see that if we just allow people to uh, travel in clicks and likes and you know only hearing what you want to hear or living in your own environment where you're um, just in a, a constant feedback loop of what you want to hear, we can't function like this. We can see how we got here and we know we have to make some sort of change. Uh, it's so true, too, that that feedback loop includes the lies you're talking about. So you just yeah. have sort of this... Uh, confirmation bias going on. So there's over and over people who are repeating the same thing that, that is not true. It just uh, today I saw uh, on this McDonald's thing, it's this ridiculous thing. It's a talking point for Trump and he goes to McDonald's because, uh, you know, Harris basically made a passing reference to the fact that she'd worked at McDonald's coming up. So what does he do? He turns into the whole thing about how she's lying, and he repeated the lie again today. Uh, he repeated the lie that she was lying. I mean, it, it, she, she, she did work, but as you suggested, there are no repercussions. That's a great word. You get away scot-free with this stuff. Yeah. And and, and, and lastly, I would say, because there are no... Uh, I would Guardrails, say that yeah. There are no guardrails in, in the broadcast network, is what I was going to say. They had minimal guardrails, but now we don't work in the broadcast network. It's all technology that's gone digital, and there really aren't any ramifications, again, to use your word, I think it's an excellent one. You don't have to own anything that you say in any sort of real way. No, and really the only feedback that they get is through civil lawsuits. You know, Fox News is a cable news network. They never had to apply for a broadcast license, so they didn't have to fit the same standards. They could lie over and over and over again about the election being stolen, convincing one third of the country of something that was entirely not true. And the only ramifications they had was a civil lawsuit from Dominion, where they ended up paying almost $800 million for lying about it, but they didn't have to go on air and say, we are sorry, we lied about it. They didn't have their license, bro their broadcast license taken away. They don't have a, a warning sign on their channel saying this show, you know, shows misinformation. We need to have some sort of, you know, Snopes or, um, you know, something that checks things or at least sure. warns us because people should be able to turn on their TV and trust the news. That is the number one cable news in the nation. And all they do is lie and their civil lawsuits prove it. But that has, we have to do better than civil lawsuits. Yeah, it's funny. Those suits that are associated with the defamatory speech, for example, in Great Britain, far tougher than we are here. But, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's, we're really, um, the great thing about America is you can say what you want. And now it's become maybe uh, it's the horses out of the barn. I don't know how you get that back. Well, but. it's a little bit like we created cars and then we were like, oh, shoot, we're braking too fast and people are flying through the windshield. We should probably put seatbelts in cars and then we should probably make those mandatory. And people thought that too, but it was to keep us safe. Then we had drunk driving laws. We added all these regulations that people are like, why can't we do this for guns? But also, why can't we do this for media? I mean, ultimately, I wrote the book so people could start asking questions and thinking like, you know, these are solutions we could actually make. These are things we could actually ask our government for. We could say we'd actually like to not be lied to every 
every day. We would like it not to be legal to lie to us constantly. I want people to feel like we can make real change out there because we actually can. Like if you look at someone like Kamala Harris winning and if she gets a trifecta, including the, the Senate and the House, she flips the House and she keeps the Senate, then they could get a lot of things accomplished really quickly. Not only doing things like returning the rights of Roe to American women as a federal uh, piece of protection, but also doing things like passing the For the People's Act, which already passed in the 117th Congress under Nancy Pelosi, but the Senate held it back because of the filibuster. But this is things that people would love in this country, making partisan gerrymandering illegal so you can't just draw your district and like kick people out so you can never lose and be someone like Jim Jordan. Things like getting dark money out of politics so somebody like Elon can't start his own PAC, personally fund it, and then just give hundreds of millions of dollars to one candidate. You shouldn't be able to buy an election in America, and that's what you can do right now. Um, getting rid of, you know, making sure that it's more fair for people, having things that uh, that set up those guardrails again so that the American people can trust their election system, they can trust their media, and we can start making real change in this country, which is entirely possible. And I want people to feel that kind of positivity. Wow. I mean, it, it does start with kind of getting into strategic positions of power, as yes. you said. Yeah. So yes. this election is so very important. I just think of uh, your kitchen rants and the way in which you through those kitchen rants actually busted through the noise. I think it's very hard to get through the media noise, and you did, and you did it in a simple way. Like you boiled stuff down, and the way in which you, I mean, just, oh yeah, Tony's got one up now, right. Uh, just the way in which you, you surround yourself from an environment we all know it's it's kind of a meaning of physical environment we're all familiar with, and then you, you're, you're just beautifully breaking stuff down. So congratulations on that. And now you've taken it to uh, all these other levels. So. I congratulate you on it. And I also think, I guess, and the reason I mentioned that all is that, you know, you in your own life with your offering show how even within this system, which is lopsided with the old media meeting new media meeting essentially falsehood media, uh, you can punch through. And if that's true, then change can punch through also. So, yeah. uh, I'd and love we to don't see even it. have to do it online. I want people to understand, like you can do that at your, you can do that at your own kitchen table. You can do that at your own dining room table when your brother or your uncle or your dad says something that's incorrect. You know, you can have those conversations, and they don't need to be animosity filled. They can be curiosity filled. That's a great way to go into conversations with people. Every single person in this nation that is aware and kind of paying attention can absolutely change the course of this nation for the better if they just take responsibility for their people. In this case, I would say like, hey, one of the reasons I wrote the book was so that um, people would feel smarter. I always say all of my work is not so you think I'm smart. It's so you feel smart. So you can go out into the world and be like, actually, I understand that issue. And here's what I think it is. Or actually, that's not true. And here's why. I wanted people to go out into the world and really feel like they understood what was going on because you can't fix something if you don't know how it works. And I wanted them to know how it works. So all of my work did that. My book in itself is just written in a conversational way to understand the country, our problems, and how we get back to where we are are trying to be the greatest country in the world. Instead of telling everyone we are, we should honestly be working on doing it. Oh, bravo, bravo. All right, my last question to you is related to this moment in time where we do see a rise in autocratic instincts on the part of Donald Trump, in the case of this lead candidate, uh, meaning he's leading his party, we see how there's a lust for power. Uh, there's, a, I, in my opinion, there's a a uh, real theocratic agenda on the part of an activist Supreme Court and, and, and beyond, and Federalist Society populating the judicial nominations with, with those who are like-minded. So anyway, there's, there's all this stuff going on. So my question to you, given the fact that the system is this electoral college system, which is uh, horribly flawed, uh, should the worst, in my view, happen, and Donald Trump uh, does ascend to the presidency, and then all of his acolytes and the associated uh, political suck-ups, they all get in there, loyalists. Um, do you, uh, Lee, do you lose hope, or do you, uh, I, I don't think you're the kind of person who ever loses hope, so I get more to the maybe the place where I'm, uh, how much time do we have before, <laughs> before it's time to go back to where we, you know, yeah, yeah. No, listen, here's the live. thing. I, I do think that if, if that terrible case scenario did happen, we would be in 
true dire straits. I think we can imagine we would look a lot like Russia, a lot like Hungary. Um, Hungary we would definitely sure. be a theocratic nation. Um, I think we need to be very clear that right now Donald Trump is no longer the candidate. He's not trying to win. Uh, he's just riling up his base, taking a lot of photos, doing this thing so that when they lose, because they are going to lose, uh, they can say it was rigged. They can say it was fake. They are pulling people's votes. They are pulling people's, uh, they are doing election vigilanteism. They have taken people off the voter rolls. They are trying to make sure the Democrats can't win. They are not actually running to win themselves because they know that they don't have the votes to win. And I think you know that based on the fact that if you have everyone from Bernie Sanders to Dick Cheney voting for the same person, something's gone deeply wrong with the other party. He cannot fill a stadium anymore. And I think that the Heritage Foundation people and the Federalist Society people and all the people that are really truly pulling the strings have ridden Donald Trump as far as they can. And they're just trying to get him across the finish line so that they can 25th amendment him or he can accidentally fall out a window or he can drink a tainted you know diet coke and they can put jd vance in who's a completely empty vessel for all of their most horrible ideas but i think we have to be really honest that they are not going to win what it's going to be is if they can if they can get neither party to 270 i think kamala's going to win 270 and then we're going to watch two months of just straight legal battles and fighting and probably violence um, as the Trump side tries to not uh, uh, allow the victory to happen. And I think that's what we really need to be prepared for. I think, I think realistically, if he just won right outright, the country would be in such dire straits. I don't think there's any way uh, around that. I really do believe he would round up his political enemies. I really do believe he would send deputized people that he had said were above the law into every city in America to try and round up whoever he wanted to round up. I think they would put people in camps. I think they would throw people into unmarked vans. I think people like General Mark Milley is right when he says, I am in danger of being court-martialed and thrown in jail or killed. Uh, by a, a next Trump presidency. I think these are all possibilities, but I do not think there is a possibility that they win this election. So I think what we need to do is prepare ourselves. We have to work for the next however many days to make sure that the people who don't want to turn this into an autocratic Christian theocratic nation um, don't win. And we need to be prepared for the mess that's going to come from November 5th to January 20th. And then we need to really stand behind uh, the president and hopefully um, a Congress that will support her work as she tries to shore up the guardrails again, because they're gone and we're in so much trouble without them. And Donald Trump would not surround himself and J.D. Vance would not surround himself with anyone other than yes men in the second administration. Um, and the guardrails that were there before, people like H.R. McMaster, people People like General Mark Milley, they won't be there a second time around. So they cannot win is really where we're at. We have to get out the vote. We have to talk to our people. We have to take responsibility. And we have to know that this is really incredibly serious. And that's why people, everyone from Russia to Elon Musk to Donald Trump himself, are pulling out every stop um, to try and grab this last vestige of power. Wow. So well said. So well said. A return to common sense, how to fix America before we really blow it. Lee McGowan's book is, uh, takes you through uh, how to do it. And I like that you also have, uh, you're a rallying point for those of us who need some place to rally because it can be pretty grim, you know what I mean? And I think there, in your message and all your messages is a sense of empowerment. And so, uh, I, and I use that word not, not very frequently on the show, but I really think you have that. So congratulations on everything and please uh, return. Congrats again on being a number one, uh, you know, a, a New York Times bestseller list and all that. Uh, a return to common sense. We'll have a link to the book underneath this video. And uh, Lee McGowan, just love talking to you. Please come and visit again. Thanks so much, Mark. Hi, it's Mark. And I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.